John has met and called his own men my work. John, I was saying you have done half my work. You know, <laughs> if I marry of a son, a daughter, um, what we'll do is that he comes to me and says, no, I want to go and marry in the house. So I say, oh, okay, wait. So we call his uncle, so he sit down and say, look, he wants to go there. So one of the uncles is no, it's not to my home. Do you remember the very long silence? Okay, thanks. Mario, but she woke up at night and cut on the head of the husband. <laughs> 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 We're managing our future. <laughs> okay. So what you've done for me is uh, my son now trying to understand where we are moving in the future. So that's basically what I'm trying to say. In other words, what I'm saying is that what I'm about to explain basically starts in 1992. With the so-called democratization, multi-party state and all this. He called it the neoliberal fallacy. But that's where this thing starts. But the point uh, we were saying, like a judo player, eh? You should understand. I mean, the judo player it could be a small guy, but he can use the weight or the strength of uh, that's the principle to defeat. So there, there are benefits if you're a judo player, even in the new neoliberal palace. So, um, as I said, as uh, John explained to us, just a quick background: Zambia, like most of Southern Africa. Um, it was an open land until 1850, and basically Zambia in 1900, where people can move, tribes can move anywhere they want. In fact, that is still uh, the practice. Uh, I'll tell you, with the Rwanda, you know, the, 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 those genocide, we have thousands and thousands of people, even during the, the liberation era, who ran to Zambia. We're still keeping them. Mr. Obote ran to Zambia, we came to them. You know, that's how this thing happened. Like. People can come and uh, live with us. And um, in Zambia, that is how it has happened. So, <coughs> around 1950s, they started to create uh, national parks. It's conservation ethic we talked about. And that involved moving people. People lived with the world like the Kafue, the Long War, but they moved them and created the uh, World Night uh, Department of World Parks, Department of Forest, and so on. So people are to be the fortress conservation we talked about. Coming to 1992, they changed now, we get into this uh, democratic era, where they decentralize or they privatize the parks and uh, everything else. But what they also do, is uh, they create registration, which, as you'll see, it has some very good uh, aspects, which says, for instance, that instead of the government being in charge of wildlife, they created one of the community resource boards where the communities around uh, the, forest, the parks can also help in the management of wildlife. Forests, you will see they've created one of community forests, which wasn't there before. So the forest and the water, we created what they called the water resource boards, fisheries. That's the new part. They are trying to, it says you should involve the communities, democracy. But the practice is what we are about to see whether or how it is working. Um, Sorry, I don't know what the right is. Just that, yeah. So, I'm sure you all know of 1992, the Agenda 21 and what was embedded. So what has happened is that uh, most of our laws, Zambia, around there were very, very friendly the governments who tried to sign up to all the environmental laws. So you'll find that for the last 20, 25 years, most of our, our registration 
embed the principles of Agenda 21, information, provision of information to communities, public participation, recourse mechanisms, all these are embedded. Now that is what the challenge is. These things are in the law, but what is the practice? Let's just go to the next one. So, yeah, we ratified that. Uh, to date, the principles have been significantly integrated in our legislation. So the Wildlife Act, Wildlife of 2015, has all those things. The community forest now, it's a new one. It's, 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 in fact, where I'm coming from, we even applied for our forest to manage. Water resources. Environmental Management Act 2011 actually demands the EIAs. Nothing can happen without the environmental management uh, uh, approving whatever. We have a new one, urban and regional planning, which is supposed to go right down to the communities to plan and consulting the communities. So, and the human rights. In fact, in the new 19, uh, the new, um, we have a five-year development plans. They want human rights to be, the communities to take to court if their human rights are. So all these acts, as I say, they made uh, the issue of information, community participation, and uh, 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 access to justice. So, yeah, thanks. Laws may be adequate, but the communities have limited knowledge about them. Now, let's see the, the, the catch. They put these things in. In the early years, when we have that friendly government, they, they, they could push you to talk to communities, educate them. But at some point in the last 10 years, there's, there's a stop. One would say stop. Because they've realized that if communities know what they need to do, that they can go to court and so on, then uh, they are empowered. So you find that they are limiting how much information can go to the communities. And that is why you find, for instance, the big mining, the, the, our new mining law, they can just talk to the chief, bribe the chief, and they get a whole chunk of land, like uh, very good uh, colleagues. So there's been a deliberate effort to ensure that communities are kept in the dark. So what we need, and that is why we are here, is to try and explain to communities, and create a, a advocacy and lobbying schemes, application of these tools, and the community resource mobilization to create, you know, like for instance, what we're talking about, the, the ICC, the indigenous community, the, the territories and lands. So that is the challenge we have. Let's move to the next one. Uh, when these things were put in place, the tenders for civil society was to say we are speaking for the community. You know, you go there. You know, state what I was talking about. Now the politicians, how is crooked politicians? Yeah. They'll come to you and say, no, you, you are representing <coughs> the community who elected you. Did you prove? You are just talking because you are eating donor money. You know? <laughs> so that's how they shut us. So what we are trying to do now is that instead of saying we are speaking for the community, is to try and get these roles, sit down with the community and empower them. This is what the law says. This is how you can play the tool. So using the, the law as a tool for the community is to defend their interests. That's the issue I'm talking about, judo player. Let the communities have the power to use the laws and tools that they, they need to see how they can uh, promote, uh, they can defend their interests. So it is about empowering communities to take legal records to provide, as provided by many pieces of legislation, the ones that we have highlighted above, through multifaceted engagement, including with the government. They, communities engaging with government, civil society facilitating that kind of arrangement. Not me going to the government and say, I'm speaking on behalf of the, the community. It doesn't work anymore. So we can move. So we have uh, a few cases where we have tried, first of all, initially as civil society, to engage with the government. One of them was, uh, uh, I think it's, it's uh, in the uh, legal, uh, uh, it's, it's documented. One of the forests was degazetted by the Kaunda government 
for purposes or whatever. But the communities organize themselves to try and, uh, oh, already. <laughs> <laughs> to try and have the places uh, 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 regazetted because it was a source of a river. So the community organized and uh, petitioned the president. So the, the president then regazetted that for us. That is again educating the, the communities what powers they have. So they, they, they petitioned the, the president, 2,500 uh, members of the original owner people, uh, gazette, uh, petitioned the president and they regazetted that one. So that's one example of empowering the community to do what they did. And this next one. Again, the, the, the setup we have now is the same forest, for instance, which was the regazette, the new group, the regazette, they've shared it. And we started to build uh, with the Chinese uh, upper market uh, housing and so on. So what is the community to use? Again, let's go to the next one. We, we have facilitated the community to mobilize, sign another petition to the new president. Huh? They did that. Uh, the, under the EMA, the Zambia Environmental Management Act, there is need for public participation where the public awareness, so that wasn't done. So the community uh, uh, are pushing for that to be uh, implemented. The communities facilitated for the minister to invoke the provision. Yeah, okay. Now, when the place was degazetted under the Forest Act, there is also provision under the Water Act for the new Minister of Water to put status, protection status on that land. So the communities are pushing for that. And then let's quickly go to the next one. So what we have done is that we have mobilized the communities. The lady in the red is she's the princess of the, the tribes that are suffering the consequences. So that those are village women who we, we mobilized to go and see the Minister of Water. So they are now on the, uh, to go and see the Minister of Water. Or the other gentleman, I don't know. <laughs> so the whole village, we call them Indunas. The guy in the, is the Minister of Water. And the, all the headmen are there and are complaining, demanding that whatever development they are doing, using his Water Act, they must stop that. And uh, the next one. Uh, and of course, we mobilize the press, private, the government ones. So that's how the, the, the Soli is the tribal group that where the, this is happening. So they mobilize, we mobilize them to come with their handmen and their donors to put pressure on government to make amends to what they're doing. Next. So what is also good is that, you know, these politicians are too busy. So what, uh, next one. They just put uh, summarize whatever they wanted into those five points. I can read it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this one. Sorry. Yeah, that one. They tell the minister stop all illegal developments in Lusaka East, stop uh, sewage, because they are spoiling sewage in the river, yeah, and all those. So that is what they gave, signed by the senior headman and, of course, our trust. So, this, in short, is uh, what uh, empowering the communities, not speaking for the communities can do. As of yesterday, I got uh, actually, after this meeting, <coughs> this meeting, the communities have actually hired a senior lawyer, state council. They were meeting yesterday with the chief minister to take the matter to, to court, so pressure from, from all sides. So that's basically where, what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. You. I'm sure it's self-explanatory. You don't need a question. <laughs> I, I have a quick question just to start. Um, so what was what is the um, the current state of things and what happened after and what do you imagine do you think there will be lasting um, impacts of this five years, ten years from now, or is there potential that even though you've made this progress that and you know there was a story of the paper and stuff that yeah. there's not really any accountability mechanism to yeah. enforce. In fact, you're very right. You know, in, you notice that we, we the petitions in 1996, mm -hmm. 2000, and the government listened to them and they regazetted, for instance, that place. They don't went to sleep. 
Now, this is a, a, a very uh, close to Lusaka. It's a lucrative uh, piece of land, real estate. But because the communities went to sleep, nature hates a vacuum. What we are getting now is these new guys, these new criminals, I call them. They are sharing their plan. So what, what exactly point, if we, we get to status quo, what should we do moving forward? Now, under the new act, Forest Act, they have said we can do what are the community forest and so on. So we have already applied to do a, manage, a management plan which will involve all the communities, including the ones that are very far, to see how best that forest can be managed to remove these uh, the negative developments. So yeah, it, it won't be as it was. We'll put in measures to develop uh, this community forest and integrate wildlife, education, and so on. So no, there are plans now to, to be active on uh, that forest once we get to a point where it's it's a tribute back to community. Using the law again. In fact, uh, that's the Forest Act, Community Forest. But even the Water Act, they've decentralized, they, they, there's what is called subcatchment councils, water management, where, which would be, you, you can't do anything within subcatchment and catchment without that committee approving these developments, including the EIAs and all. Again, what has happened that the devolution that we talked about has been stopped because you'll be empowering the people. This thing can't happen if the catch subcatchment council was in place. So they, they haven't. So the idea now is to push to ensure that those subcatchment councils, the devolution actually takes place and the power is with the people. So nothing happens upstream or downstream without the permission of who? That uh, subcatchment council where communities will be represented. But as matters stand, this is what law says, but they don't want to implement that. Because then, it, you know, power moves from them to the people. Mm. But the people must know that, and that's what we're trying to do is push for this. 2019, we're having elections. So these guys are, I don't know if you say this, in, uh, where are ladies are, they are peeing in their trousers. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Other questions for Robert? John. Now we have John and then Colin and Caroline. So you seem to be pointing to an important area of, of natural resource uh, decision making, which is the use of the courts and law in order to push community action forward. And uh, of course, in the areas that we're looking at in uh, Kenya and Tanzania, legal cases have been extremely important for communities to put their, uh, their cases forward. On the other hand, it's uh, uh, our colleague Oli Simo may be very aware of us when I was saying, uh, discussing the situation, and I said, oh, take it to court. He said, he said, he said wait, because the courts can be very, once they rule, you've got a precedent, and you never know what's between the, the case and the outcome. Uh, and then you have precedents that are building up that are, can be very dangerous. Uh, so I wondered if, if, if the, 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 the use of the courts is now intrinsic to the protection of, of um, natural resources for communities, whether this is a, a, a routine thing, and what sort of dangers you, uh, you think have been uh, exposing the communities to by mm. going to the courts? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's very interesting that uh, there are dangers, yes, and especially now. But historically, going back, uh, when we took some of these cases to court mm. in the earlier years, uh, the beautiful thing that has happened, for instance, over the was amazing, was that when we go to court, the university students, the ones that are doing environmental law, mm. they, you know, from the Commonwealth, they actually hire a bus to come and listen to the court cases. So what are we doing? Uh, the movement that uh, Colin was talking about. We're planting seeds into the future. So the future lawyers, will, they, in fact, they are citing some of the cases that were Noah Zambezi and others as uh, precedents. Now, the point you raise is that this, the fellow we have now as president, is a, is a failed lawyer. So what is, they've created, like in King, uh, they, they, they put a, a court court, what is, between the high court and the lower court, they put something, appeal court or something. Mm -hmm. Now he has filled up this appeal court with his own bodies, 
It's just the same thing that Mr. Trump has done. So when we took the case to court, it, the, the lower court gave us uh, uh, on our uh, in our favor. But when, when it goes to this other court, this woman who was a, sorry, it's not a woman, she's a judge. She's been appointed by this uh, You know what she says? She says, who are you? Uh, you're just a busy body. And she threw out that So yeah, you're talking about, but there's a, of course there's still the, the higher court. Yes, there's a danger that you may lock yourself in a uh, president. But that is why we are also using the, the court of public opinion. Mm. You know, the lawyers, everybody else, to be part of this. The community plus the nation are involved in this thing. That's what I was saying to Steve yesterday. Is if you go as a civil society, you know, they will just cancel you out. But if you, the groundswell of the population, that's what we try to do. Mass movement. Mass movement, yeah. yes. So that's one of the ways of, of doing it. But yes, there's a danger that uh, you know, they may move uh, wrongly and that stays as a president. Yeah. You call it your sense? Yeah, Be between, um, between your talk and John's, I, actually I was, I, I was uh, thinking <coughs> about the, the relationship between uh, John's more institutional perspective on sideways decision making and and the way that I think uh, sideways decision making in in your context, but with more greater emphasis on on law and what devolution you use the the word devolution. And, you know, this this was a word that was used quite a lot. 25 years ago in Canada, in indigenous contexts. And it, uh, it reminds me really of a contrast which has been sort of forming in my mind as I've listened to different African cases. Um, it was categoric, it's been categor categorically rejected in Canada, in throughout Latin America by indigenous communities. So you cannot devolve power to us we already have the power. Um, and, you know, that's their discourse. The inherent rights. And we are going to insist upon and demand territorial self-determination. And of course, we will work with civil society organizations and through laws and, uh, and you know, in the texture of what people are actually doing, there's much less contrast. But there's a very marked contrast um, in the kind of discourse of collective, regional, federated, territorial self-determination. That's the, that's the formula which is emerging uh, in, at least in, in parts of the Americas where there are sufficiently large territories which are still plausibly controllable uh, by indigenous governments, yeah. by indigenous nations. And that's, this is a very interesting to yeah. me, that, that, that difference in the imagination mm. of the political landscape in which you're operating. Mm. Uh, I was, I don't know what I was discussing with you. We were in Bajo for the indigenous, when they were introducing rate, you know, reducing emissions. And the indigenous people's conference and that. And that was where I was exposed to what you just described. We call ourselves local communities, or communities living around forests. And then when that they wanted to conflict local communities and indigenous people, there was a massive reaction from the indigenous people. To say, no, 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 indigenous people are indigenous people, different from local communities. Now, coming from, I'm sure even uh, Michael tell you, when we talk about local communities or indigenous people, there wasn't any such a distinction as you get in, in the Americas. But for us, one of the reasons why uh, indigenousness, or just even the tribe, was suppressed, was only a notion of, of uh, when we're fighting for independence, you are fighting for a nation, so it's nationalism. So tribal <coughs> were kind of suppressed. Same thing with Zambia. 
Our motto is one Zambia, one nation. So all tribes, 72 of them, follow under this umbrella. Now, it is only now, you know, when this thing is away now. The way the British run Zambia, for instance, we have, as I said, it was a mining nation. So they have a railway line coming from there to the mines. Outside there was a pool of labor. People came from there to work in the mines. That's why you hear Zambia is one of the most industrialized. Mining is not like uh, working on a, a Muzungu farm in Naivashi. In, 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 in the weekend, you go back to your chamber. You go to sit. I was born in a mining. My, my great grandfather, my grandfather was a miner in the 1918. And my father, you know, that's how it. So you find that they all people migrating to work in the mines. And usually the tribe doesn't play again. They are miners. They go underground and come back. But, and therefore you find this state land, which was owned by the government, titles and everything. And then outside there is traditional land, which is run almost as it was, exclusive under chiefs. So there, it has remained like that for quite a bit. Now there's a Trek called state land is finishing. Some of the wealth and mines are like barred out. So now they're trying to to get the uh, tribal lands, and that is where now the problems are arising. The World Bank came in and changed all that. It says no, no, no. Uh, what we need to do is that you just talk to the chief, one stop shop, and you get all chunk of that. Screaming this uh, Washington consensus. So this is now, and they're now saying we should title traditional land, make it possible for Standard Bank and other to sell land. They are sowing seeds of uh, war. So actually, you go, the, 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 the other guys also, they set up their local government here, where the chiefs are part of that local government. But below that is the traditional land. You go that, you know, these are burial sites, this is, you know, those things still exist. Now they want to cadastral map all that. So that is where now what it was in South America is beginning to remain. People say, no, no, no. Even if uh, this is, uh, it is still our land. You see those sorry people. All of Saka is their land. Now they're waking, they're waking up to and demanding that, they, you know, you can. It's, it's beginning to happen everywhere. In Zambia. So, you know, yeah, some of these things will not surface until something triggers it. And that's that's what's happening. We will get into the situation when it's out there. I think I just wanted to uh, try and uh, respond to Dr. Cody. Uh, yeah. I think one of the major. You want to help me? Mm, yeah, one of the major differences between why in. in, in in certain in Latin American, uh, some parts of, uh, I mean, Canada and Australia, why, why, and the, the, I mean, the, the demands for indigenous groups are very strong. Is because they have legal recognition. They are legally recognized. In Africa, this is still very fluky. We are using strategic openings within the space created through progress, and I think that's to me the best thing. And also, the other thing, if you look into the poverty levels. Indigenous groups in Africa are still struggling with their daily social kind of basic needs. See? While in certain areas, while there is poverty in other parts that I know, Latin America and also in Canada, but I think they are in certain, like in the US and in Canada, I think they are slightly above that. They are, they are, they are, they are dealing with another level of poverty, not here. Where, I, and the government here, it's not, the, the space is not that, that big. We are creating, we are fighting for spaces. But to me, I think the, uh, the, the whole issue is uh, the legal recognition. The legal recognition. You find the voice of African indigenous peoples in, in Kenya, and you find the same voice in, in African Commission or in the United Nations system. Their voices are very strong, actually, there. Because the repression at the country level is actually very tough. So they talk more and more tough outside than what they do here. To add very quickly to that, 
is that um, because of what is described, uh, indigenous groups have to go beyond national boundaries to get rights uh, in higher courts like in Kenya. A few gains, uh, legal gains that have been made have uh, actually come from the African what's the name of the court? The African African Yes, exactly. So also again to just demonstrate that that space is not uh, I mean that legal space is not very well I mean formed in African context uh, at national level. But I think that's what I was saying that uh, uh, the sport race from the, the conservation the people are removed from but because of the uh, the global approach of trying to democratize including everybody in, including business by the way it doesn't doesn't happen if you follow we have they had to struggle for UN drip but the starting point is 1948 when they put into the charter the UN charter the human rights and if you see how it has evolved, I think ILO 169 and uh, the other ones. But they all starting from international pressures. John Humphrey from Canada. Yes. Was uh, the main author of, uh, of, uh, of the, the... It was from Miguel. Yeah. So, so the point I'm saying is that we are trying to use, even us, those uh, uh, statutes of uh, justice, uh, uh, participation are from outside, but they've incorporated them in our laws. So now what we are saying, we go to court and say, so our law says communities must do this. Can you? But it's not from the bottom, it's come from outside. Uh, I, I, don't, I hope you, you understand what I'm saying. So it, it's these things, it's a global thing, we need to take advantage of what's happening elsewhere. And, but I'm, you have done a lot of work, Kenyans now. Can I just briefly come in? The, the, there's one example in, uh, in the Kenyan context of something comparable to what Colin is describing, where you have nations in Canada that, that uh, affirm, in part through treaty rights, that uh, they have certain inherent rights. And that's the Maasai, because they, uh, they had treaty rights. Uh, and that was actually part and parcel of, uh, of law through the colonial period. And in 1963, they took those rights and they tucked them into a minor ministry called the Ministry of, uh, of um, Local Government. So now the only access they would have would be through local government, which of course is, is as you're describing, uh, local communities, et cetera. And uh, I think something was lost at that point when the, 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 the nature of the Maasai is having had a relationship to the British Crown uh, in which their, their rights and their territory was, uh, was, was guaranteed, and then suddenly they're under the Ministry of Local Government. <laughs>